Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Next Gen Planners podcast. My name is Amelia Hamilton, and I am head of community here at Next Gen Planners. And we have a fantastic episode uh, for you today, uh, where I am joined by the brilliant Linda Kelland. Welcome to the podcast, Linda. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's our pleasure. I'm sorry, I should first perhaps outline uh, what you do, which is is kind of a hard, a, a hard thing to do, actually, because as you've got your fingers in a lot of different pies, but I will just give you the title as neurodiversity, neurodiversity specialist. It's quite hard to say that, actually. <laughs> um, so I guess to to kind of get give people an idea of um, what you do what that means the different areas of your of your uh, professional life um could you just start by giving us an overview of what a day in the life of linda kelland looks like well what i love about the day in the life of linda kelland is it's different <laughs> <laughs> it's different yeah. I mean, as you said i'm a neurodiversity specialist i'm an adhd and an executive functioning coach and I'm a neurodiversity specialist study skills tutor. So those, those have slightly different hats on. Um, and I can be working with someone online or in person. Um, and I'm either helping someone in the workplace uh, or in higher education, undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD. Um, and through the joys of online working, I can be supporting people anywhere around the world. So depending on what time zone there are, they there are on um is is what my what my day looks like um and what do i do well what do i do well um what i do is i'm helping people to really understand and embrace and celebrate their brains um so you know work with it while understanding that being neurodiverse does bring additional challenges so how the way in which I work is is very much looking at strengths based. You know, what are what what are the strengths of those individuals? And then together we look at what they, you know, how to capitalize on their strengths and reach those potentials, work out where do they want to go, what are their goals, what's standing in their way, and how can we work together to work out the best way forward. Amazing. It sounds like a very interesting day-to-day -day career to have. Yes, it is. It is. You've got you've got that sense of autonomy that you can you can manage your your workspace and you can manage how you work and when you work. And if you're saying, oh, do you know what? I'm going to start later today and go for a walk with a dog. That's fine yeah. because I might be seeing someone later in the day because of the time zone that they're on in, anywhere in the world. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And has that changed a lot since the pandemic or was that always the case? I think I was doing a little bit of online working before the pandemic, um, but once everybody embraced online working, um, then that sort of opened the door for more supporting people ac across the world, really, um, because we suddenly all got up to skills with our online working. Yeah. And, and does it do you feel like it makes a difference in your approach to helping people who are neurodiverse if you have them kind of virtually rather than in person? Well, I think when I first went into it, I was I was thinking, well, you know, this will be a difference. But actually, um, you can forget that you've never met someone <laughs> because mm. you know it's it, you you know it can be quite intense. Um, you're you know you're very much looking face to face, and you're allowing the person to create their environment. So if there's somebody that needs to move, that's fine. If there's somebody that needs to fiddle with something, they could be fiddle with something like this out, out of out of screen. Um, yeah, I think it works really really well. And I guess it's then not distracting you so much if they're they're doing things off, <laughs> off screen. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a really interesting um, field to be to be working in. What made you want to to get involved in it in the first place? Well, why would you not? <laughs> <laughs> Well, do not, you know, empowering amazing people to reach their goals, you know, um, and I'm a lifelong learner. Um, I've got, com you know, compassionate curiosity. How can I help? How can I help people? And I sort of bring that that level of passion and drive and energy into helping and empowering others. 
um, and really working for that. So nothing needs to be fixed. Uh, you, you know, we just need to embrace the way your brain works. And I get such a privileged insight into people's lives, their hopes, their dreams, um, and really sort of helping helping people gain that self-awareness of, of what's the best way forward for me. How do I do that? And it's so individual, but mm. what can trust one person to the next? Um, and often people kind of developed sort of strategies or coping mechanisms, some of those sort of not very healthy, or in a scattergun approach without fully understanding of why is that working? What What is happening? Why am I feeling like that? What do I need to do? feeling stuck how can I how can I move forward um and I I don't know I, I guess to go on that journey with people and that's just amazing um and if I'm supporting um students in university I get to know about all the, the various topics that they're they're studying which is also feeds my brain in terms of all yeah. that love of learning Definitely. And so in this podcast episode we're going to talk a lot about neurodiversity quite broadly because as a as a subject as a topic there's so, it's so vast and there's so many avenues that we could go down and and really um look deep into um but we're just going to take it as um a step back and kind of look at more of a broad overview so to to um before we go into these conversations i think it would be helpful um if you could just give uh, a brief de definition of what neurodiversity actually is okay well neurodiversity is a different way of thinking it's a collective term for people who are dyslexic dyspraxic adhd or, or, or autistic um and you can really sort of characterize it as an unusual balance of skills you know it's got and it's got lots of benefits and lots of strengths for the individual and the employer but there's also some additional challenges and as such, um, and when we look at that from under the social model of disability, we can see that people are disabled by the environment rather than there's inherently anything wrong with them. It's just they're being disabled by that environment. Um, and therefore it's recognized under the Equalities Act 2010 as a disability. And as such, companies are legally required to put in place reasonable adjustments. Amazing. Excellent definition there. Um, and you mentioned something that I'm, I've only recently kind of been made aware of, which is really, really fascinating. And, and it's this idea of the social model of disability. Um, and as I understand it, there used to be a different way of understanding um, disability and neurodiversity as a disability. And that was the medical model. Um, could you give kind of the distinction between these two models and why that there was a shift from one to the other? Well, there, there are various definitions of, of, of models of, of disability. The medical model looks at, OK, we're going to pathologise this. We're going to, we, we say these are the problems and we need in some way to fix that to make you fit in with the rest of society or, or neurotypical as the right way to do things. A lot of people said, you know, under the social model of disability, what we're saying is that disability is just one aspect of that person's identity, as in race, ethnicity. Um, and actually, we're not fixing it. We're just saying we're being disabled by the environment. What can we do about removing barriers, raising awareness, changing attitudes, practice, policy, so that we can we can all be a part of this wonderful world? Um, and, you know, sometimes that can be quite difficult to get your head around with all oh, what does that mean you know being disabled by it, the environment and you know one example may be you know if, if 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 everyone tomorrow who wore glasses just for reading they said okay well everyone's coming into work tomorrow we've decided we don't want anyone to wear glasses go wear your glasses and we're going to reduce the size of the print on your screens to it's teeny tiny and we just want you to do your job as you normally do it um you would be disabled by the environment because one, you would find it really stressful. Two, you'd find it really, really difficult. And if you could do it, you'd be straining your eyes all day and be exhausted. So that sort of a sense of of every day, how what a big difference that can make. So we're not being ableist, and that's another word that we're throwing there as well, which is about. Yeah. You know, if people aren't forming in a neurotypical way, 
um, it's not wrong, it's just different. Um, so it's again, it's about embracing that difference and, 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 and enrichment. Um, and we also have things like um, with ADHD, we have something that's called situational variability, where if in certain circumstances, a person with ADHD will have no problems or difficulties doing what they want to do. If the, if the right set of circumstances are there, like if they're interested and, mm -hmm. and the, all of those things. So we see, oh, OK, that's that, you know, that's being disabled by the environment. So it might be yeah. actually certain working practices are just do not work for, for certain people. So. Yeah. And it goes back to the definition where you say it's this unusual balance of skills. And I think that really I mean, it's been really um kind of enlightening for me to understand neurodiversity in uh, in terms of being a disability, however, it not um, having the kind of stigma that it then, it means you're unable to do X, Y, Z. It, it's looking at that kind of variability where you could excel in X, you know, find Y really difficult and be pretty average at Z. And so it's not being able to, it's looking at kind of neurodiversity and trying to see it from a, that individual kind of point of view. And that can be um, quite hard sometimes. And that, and I think that leads me into my, my next question. And that's kind of about the misconceptions around neurodiversity. Cause I, I think that there, there still remains a lot of misconceptions about what neurodiversity is, the impact it can have on people and, and how, um, you know, employers or teachers or whoever should respond um, to these individuals. Because um, as you said, you know, there's not necessarily a one size fits all for everybody. Um, mm. But I guess a, a more broader question to, th to throw back at you. What do you see as some of the more or, or most common misconceptions around neurodiversity? Well, we talk about it being a hidden disability. Um, but it's not, <laughs> you know, if we observe it is, it is there. Um, and what the results is people try to hide it because they don't, they feel like, oh, you know, I've got to fit in, I've got to fit in, and I'll be judged negatively if I don't fit in. Mm. Um, and that, that results in that sense of masking and, 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 and negative coping strategies and raising of anxiety and all of those things. So that's one of the things that, that, that I'd like to address too, is that it's, it's in, that there's any some way linked to IQ. Neurodiversity happens across, as is in the general population, across the full range of IQ. So wherever you are, it, 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 it can be there. And it is that unusual balance of skills. So, you know, so if you're assessing, uh, as I also, one of the other hats I have is um, yeah. um, <laughs> I um, can um, diagnostically assess for, say, dyslexia, dyspraxia. And, and um, when we're looking at that, it's that the difference between the strengths and the weaknesses is much more pronounced than the general population. So yes, you could be really good at, um, at one area, say someone with dyslexia is very good visually, uh, and they can be very good verbally, but when it comes to you know, written, that that can be more of, it should just take a bit longer. It doesn't, you know, not necessarily, yeah. it takes a bit longer. So those, those are sort of things. Also, when we, we take things like um, ADHD, like the classic ADHD is the naughty boy jumping around the room. Well, that doesn't take, that's not how it necessarily presents in women. It's not how it presents in girls, you know, for various reasons like, um, you know, uh, society pressures, expectations on women. They may have more sort of um, inattent inattentive type of ADHD as opposed to hyper uh again it's 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 so it's those differences of looking at what happens um how it's presenting so you may have the same you know condition within the brain but how it presents is very different um again sort of coming back to the dyslexics and the uh you know people have a, a general idea that oh dyslexia means you can't read well that's not not the case you know and i diagnostically assessed a lot of the top universities such as LSE, Cambridge, um, and, you know, diagnosis says, yep, you're dyslexic. It just means it's going to maybe take you that little bit longer. 
Um, and it's just being aware that just because we've said you've got something and you've got that label doesn't mean it's saying you can't do something. It's about talking to that individual and really finding out what works for them. How can how can we remove those barriers? Yeah, and I think you know the point about IQ and 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 it has no relevance to how smart or or, or not you are if you are neurodiverse. It's just we are a general population who exists on a bell curve of IQ and in that bell curve also is neurodiversity which will also exist on the same um kind of uh, spectrum and it's it's fascinating that you you think that somebody can get to one of these top universities in which you know reading would be such an integral part of their day-to-day -day life and and their their studies and you, you can get all the way to there and still not quite realize that oh actually I, I, there, I might actually have some diff extra difficulties in this area, which with the right kind of support could make life a whole lot easier for me. And um, and it's and it's just fascinating that that, uh, you know, it's that it can go that far before people might start to think, oh, maybe I should talk to somebody because I don't seem to be processing things in the same way as other people are. Mm. Yeah, and again, it is that difference of strengths and, and, and weaknesses. And you may find somebody that, that yeah, their weaknesses are on the average range, but their strengths are in the superior range, you know, and, and that kind of kind of difference that you, you observe. But it's, yes, it's very much if you were good at school and you've got the grades and you hit everything, and again, that's just where we get a lot of late diagnosis, smart ADHD is, they did well at school, they got all the grades, they, there was never a problem, no one's ever worried about them. Yeah, sometimes they seem to do things that were a little inconsistent, and that's when they possibly get, oh, just pay a bit of attention, uh, rather, and that builds up yeah. some sort of negative things there, um, because we're not really understanding what's what's going on. And But it does mean that people who are, you know, not appearing to have problems within a school environment, um get overlooked um and they because they're they're achieving the baseline that's necessary for uh, any attention to be drawn to them and then that possibly yeah. makes them oh i get the negative feedback when this particular um characteristic is displayed so do you know what? i'll hide that because i don't get good mm. feedback from people mm. yeah Absolutely. And it's really interesting, all of this. And, and I want to kind of bring it back to financial planning in a second. But just just one more question, um, more broadly speaking, before I do. Um, and that you, you kind of shared a lot of different um, ways in which neurodiversity is understood um, in the in the kind of uh, professional and academic circles that that you work in. Are there any other uh, trends or, or different ways of viewing neurodiversity that you think is yet to hit the mainstream understanding kind of on top of all of the ones that we've we've already <laughs> talked about so far well i mean i think that the, the big thing coming here really is the difference in presentation of men and women um and i, I know that you've you, that, that you're also having a, a sort of neurodivergent women in the financial community to, that was discussed in further so please do tune into that because you'll get more yes, of it we've got a more. we've got a workshop that will be uh recorded and up on the community um i think it'll be going live the same day this podcast going live so if you've missed it um it will be it will be up on our our next gen plans community um for you to look at at a later date yeah yeah and and just sort of just a little snippet you know bit of a bit of a trailer for it um you know um <laughs> <laughs> research has histor historically all been done on men because women's hormones got them down. So it's like, oh, we want the baseline. We don't want too many variables. So we'll just do it on men. But you know, women are just not smaller versions of men. <laughs> they are different. Um, you know, they're different biologically, the impact of, of estrogen in terms of, particularly with things like ADHD, the, the difficulties that you're likely to experience with ADHD depends on how much the rise and fall of estrogen. We, we also don't even know, because there hasn't been any research done on what the difference of, of testosterone in women is on symptoms of ADHD. It just hasn't been done. It's been, oh, we should research this. Um, so 
again, it's the, it's the impact and, and the difference. So we've got a biological difference, plus we've got a social difference in the expectations of women, of a women to have good executive function, to be the one that's planning everything, to, and, and what we see is that there are often shifts for women with ADHD in terms of shift of, of estrogen levels. So whether that's hitting puberty, whether that's just over the course of a month, whether that's when you're perimenopause, whether it's menopause, all of those shifts, suddenly you go, oh God, or, you know, when the estrogen falls, yeah. the party stops and then life gets more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love the phrase when the estrogen falls the party stops I think that <laughs> that is I want to have that hanging in my wall somewhere in my house uh yeah that's that is beautiful that is poetry when estrogen falls the party stops don't we know it don't we know it? um yeah I, and, and it's I think that's definitely not a, a conversation because we're we're barely kind of having conversations about the impact of neurodiversity kind of generally, let alone looking at the specifics and how it might really impact an individual or an individual's ability to work, not just, you know, over over a year or whatever, but day to day, week to week, you know, um, yeah. there's going to be a change in what they need, at, people need at different times. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a really important thing to to kind of bring, bring forward and, and hopefully... Um, you know, if, if people want to hear even more about that, then check out our neurodivergent women <laughs> workshop, which it, uh, which is going to be fantastic. Uh, so, bringing it back to uh, financial planning, then as as a profession, what do you think might be some common barriers to entry in a in a field like financial planning? What might stop an individual being able to excel or or even just access the profession? Well, yeah, I mean, like like you say, access the profession. So, you know, you know, is the recruitment hiring process, is it unintentionally ableist? Um, and if I can sort of draw on, you know, um, you know, 10 years ago, I was working as at the LSE as a manager of the neurodiversity services. And we were working with big companies, you know, big investment banks like Goldman Sachs, and they were looking at an inclusive recruitment process. And, and part of that, was that they'd have sort of preparation days for disabled uh, applicants um, where they would give those, you know, it went along, you were all invited, and they'd give those individuals more guidance on what was expected. They'd give them practice interviews with feedback um, that was given there and then. Um, and, you know, and, and if a, an applicant, a disabled applicant met the essential criteria, then they were guaranteed an interview. Now, whether you got the job was up to you. It was the best person from the job from there, but it got your foot in the door. And they weren't doing this out of the kindness of the hearts, which we don't, we don't see investment bankers doing. Um, they were doing it because they recognised we do not want to miss out on the talent because our recruitment process is unintentionally ableist and is we are losing people out. So it's it's the same. It's it's looking at are your processes is there something about the way you're which ask asking people to work that isn't isn't going to work for that individual where are you advertising the posts are you advertising the posts you know are they across everything i mean i think back to you know you know like my, my very careers that i've had you know i um uh worked as an electrical design engineer i got a degree in engineering before that i sort of time served electrician um where was that job advertised this is back in the 80s back in the dark ages um it was advertised in a free magazine that was on the train called miss london um if anyone's old enough they'll remember it um so it's like <laughs> where are you advertising it you know you're not advertising it in um something if you want more women in an area then you've got to advertise in that place if you want more disabled people where are you advertising are you opening it out to other areas so so those are the sort of things that we're, we start to look at and then it's working environment are we going down a stereotype are we going oh poor all oh, those poor disabled people oh that's poor you know it's not like that <laughs> it's um you know is there microaggressions going on there that we don't even know that we're doing um you know are we forcing people to hide or mask the disability because it's not an accepting environment which then leads people to 
you know, neurotypical or neurodiverse people to boom, bust, burn out, can't work there anymore, I've got to go. And I, I kind of bring this back to kind of my own experience. Like I, I talked about having worked as a um, design engineer um, and and basically what before I left uh, engineering, um, I decided to negotiate a, a, a four day working week. So a squish of five days into four. I then decided I'd do a master's on that other day um, and then decided, you know what, it'd be really good. I could use that um, um, I, if I got pregnant as well, because I could use my maternity leave as a study, study, as studying as well. <laughs> yes, it was crazy. <laughs> Um, but it was, you know, you did it, you made it work. But what I realized is once I'd had, once I'd had that child was actually that, that environment that was very, very male and quite toxic. Um, it felt a little bit like you were banging your head against a brick wall constantly. And you didn't even know you were doing it until you came out of that environment and went, Oh, do you know what? I don't feel like doing that again. And when I went leading back to the question we talked about before was when I went into the field of of changing careers and looking at going to neurodiversity I wanted something that was going to be a more inclusive environment for me and what I wanted you know I wanted something that was flexible something that would allow my career to develop that really to feed my constant love of learning and just me sweeties for the brain um but also that enabled me to be there for my children, you know, so it's so once I could find that inclusive environment that allowed me to be me, I went, do you know what? I'm I'm off. And I and I love work, working in engineering, and, and there's a big demand for more women in engineering, but the environment is not inclusive, so we're not any better off than we were in the figures when I left in the 1990s. Um than we were in the 1990s. We haven't got any more. Why? because we haven't got an inclusive environment. So if we want, we've got to make an active effort to make an environment more inclusive. And what that means is talking to the people, talk, you know, have that group of feedback because you may not know what, you need to speak to people who are neurodiverse. Have you got a neurodiverse group? Are we, are we talking about what works for us? Can we be in a non-judgmental environment? Yeah, I mean, that. there's so many good things I'd love to, to pick up on uh, in that answer. But but where you, you've kind of left it is, is, um, is an interesting place to, to, to perhaps um, take it from in the sense of it, it's so important to, you know, make sure that you're making your uh, workspace inclusive enough by asking the people to whom you would like to make it inclusive for. But it's also about not isolating or... or you know, tokenizing them in some way where it's, oh, well, you are this person and therefore you speak for everybody and we only need one person and we'll just ask one person and that's it. I don't need to go any further and I don't need to, uh, to, to have any more conversations. I've got one person who, you know, is, uh, is formally diagnosed autistic. I'm done. Um, and as we've, because we've, um, <laughs> we've got a video, video series that's on the uh, community as well, kind of covering off some some of these um, topics and questions, and and something that you mentioned there, which I which I think is is really important, is if you've met one person who's neurodiverse, you've met one person who is neurodiverse. It me, it doesn't really mean that much. I mean, it's better than than nobody, but um, <laughs> it, it it doesn't yeah. actually give you that much more in, information because. There's, yeah. everybody is so individual and um you know one person who's autistic could, could be so different to to somebody else um so so you really do have to make sure that you're engaging um with you know content other content other items hearing people speak talking to, to to different groups directly and that's the only way you're going to be able to you know reflect on your own processes and systems and make sure that they are fair and you're not missing out and i and i think it's really it's really great that you highlight that people aren't necessarily doing this out of the kindness of their own heart it's 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 for their benefit it's for everybody's benefit you know it's it's a real quid pro quo situation where people are not missing out on jobs unnecessarily and unfairly and and workplaces aren't missing out on talent unnecessarily either 
Um, and it's and it's a lot more of an Im important conversation than I think um, people give it time for. Uh, yeah. And it, it's it's yeah, that's kind of you know having a whole day um, for for people who might need you know some what's the phrase that reasonable adjustments. That's that it's it, it's just it's not you know it's reasonable isn't it? sensation. <laughs> yeah. It's just reasonable. I mean, they do. There is also a phrase within the disability community, which is nothing about us without us. You know, mm. don't start planning something without actually talking, you know, talking to the people that it impacts. You know, let's have let's have a discussion about this. What's what's you know, what's going on? So, yeah, absolutely. Well, some really, really great insights there as to um, what some barriers to entry might be and how perhaps we can help to overcome them. Um, so moving it across to not just necessarily um, your employees or, or, or attracting talent, um, but more to clients, because as we said, you know, the whole population, I, I think if I remember correctly, it's about 15% of the population we believe to be neurodiverse. So if an, a, a financial planner is dealing with a, a spread of the general population, could be that 15% give or take of your clients are neurodiverse. So these are kind of conversations that um, you might want to have in mind when when engaging with your clients. Um, so my my question kind of to you, Linda, is, is why is it important to understand kind of some of the effects of, of neurodiversity when um, talking and, and, and managing clients? And, and how does it affect individuals' relationship to money? Well, from my understanding with with what your the financial plans are doing it's very much dealing with clients is about communication it's about good communication it's about building trust it's helping to understand what the financial aims are of that person without in a non-judgmental way you don't want them just saying what they think you want them to say um so it's really vital that we start looking at how do we build better communication so if we can really get to understand what's going on, how can you know how are they processing that information? You know, they may have some executive function challenges, such as working memory or processing speed. So, and if I mean, and you know, that sounds a little bit jargony there. You know, working memory is what you hold in your short-term memory while you deal with it. So you might be explaining a concept or an idea or a package or whatever. And they've got to hold that while they think about mm, how does this work with my real world as well as oh do I want another cup of tea um and and then that process is to be of how they're processing information so if we just take for example um you may find if someone's dyslexic they're very fast at processing visual information so if you present them with a graph you don't need to present them with text and text pages and pages of text of information um because they may not get that and the other thing is, if they start to feel stressed, then it becomes more difficult to kind of read. They're, they're kind of reading it, but it's not going in. Um, but a graph, phew, they may love a graph, whereas someone who's dyspraxic may freak out about the sign of the graph. They're like, oh, I don't know what that means. Oh, I've never understood graphs. Oh, give me some text. Um, so if we're asking people, how? What works for you? Uh, again, you know, if we were looking at someone with ADHD, they may struggle to maintain attention. They might find it difficult to be stationary. You know, is it good to have a walking meeting? Would that be a better way? You know, because it's keeping keeping you moving. Um, it, it, do some will some clients prefer to meet online, or do they want things more in text and they they find it in, too intense to meet you? So. It's just trying to find out what's their preference for information delivery. Um, would they like the meeting recorded? Because if they if they're struggling to think, oh, I've got to remember all this, I've got to remember all this. Just a simple thing like, oh, we'll meet on Zoom. I'll press the record function. You can then re-listen to it whenever you want to. It's it's not taking any more effort on your part, but. It, it means that your client, you may start to get that connection with the client and it's not, oh, well, I expect you to remember everything. It's how would you like the information? To, I can I can bullet the key points for you. I can bring a summary to the beginning. Um, it's, so it's just about 
the importance of communication and asking asking them what's the best yeah. way for you and again it's not you don't necessarily need somebody to to have a formal diagnosis where you're fully aware of what well, this person is you know whatever and it's it's just about well this is actually quite a good technique and strategy to have for everybody because then it means everybody can can kind of have that individual uh relationship with their financial planner in a way that they feel heard understood respected mm -hmm. and you're gonna build that trust even more and and be able to um do the best possible job you can for them. So again, it's coming back to this idea of, yes, all of these conversations are under the umbrella of kind of neurodiversity and, and making sure that we are um, doing the, the the best that we can there, but also it just it just works for everybody. And it's, yeah. it's helping, it's a net positive overall. Yeah, and the other question you were asking me is about how you know how it affects clients relationship to, to money and um i'd really like to, to, to i mean i think this is, is quite noticeable in terms of adhd because adhd they can be more impulsive so there can be more is impulsive spending so how do we address that impulsive spending those those subscriptions not necessarily you know hiding the bills because i don't actually want to face looking at them or you know um moving forward with that so you know, so it may be that we start to open that question with non judgment, with no shame involved in, uh, yeah, I'm terrible at impulse spending. So how how can we find a way to look at that? Um, you, you know, something like, um, you know, even if you say, okay, can I put a pause in that in impulse spend online spending? You can buy whatever you want, but you've got to put it in the wish basket for 24 hours. If you still want it 24 hours later, then you can get it. And don't have your credit card details automatically on there. So if you want to buy it, you've actually got to get your credit card out and type the numbers in. That gives you a pause of, do I really want this? Um, is this who I want to be? Or do I really want to save up for or to save for the future? So it's, it, again, it's like if we've got good communication, then when we start to look at okay what are the what are the things that you are are, are dealing with um if we've got a lot of it in post spending can we get the same buzz in saving money as we do from buying that stuff you know can we get the same buzz out of getting a bargain can we be looking at the, the charity shops and saving a planet and look look i managed to get a fantastic deal on x is the buzz as opposed to just more stuff which then becomes more clutter which then becomes more things we have to deal with um so it's creating a pause naturally creating a pause um and and then start to look at oh let's let's maybe in some hand holding needs to go in with looking at those subscriptions and cancelling those subscriptions um being aware of how much money's going going out um and it's it's also again with adhd is that perception of time um and we have this other and throw a throw of doing the terms in you know temporary um discounting is suddenly pizza with friends right now versus saving money because we want to do something in six months to time like a holiday or whatever it can be really, really difficult. So bringing that sense of, okay, is there a pause between doing this? And that, again, comes into some of the ADHD coaching, but with, with, with um, financial planning, it's having those, in those discussions. And the perception of time and seeing themselves in the future, is there some way they can, um, you can help them to understand where do I want to be in in ten years' time with my finances? What am I looking looking to do? And it may be, you know, as you get older, ten years ago doesn't seem that very long ago. So if you're now talking about where I want to be in ten years, again, you know, is is that something you can relate to your mother being at the same age, your father being at the same age? Is there some way you can have some app that artificially ages your image so you can get a sense of this is who I will be or what I look like? To get a better sense of future you yeah that i mean all very 
out of the box, interesting ways of looking at things, which um, are interesting things to explore as financial planners. I think there's a lot of avenues that, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily think of straight away. Um, so moving away from clients then um, and to the individual themselves, I just wanted to touch on um, if there are financial planners who are neurodiverse, uh, do you have some strategies or tools or, or tips to, to help individuals um, with some of the difficulties that they might encounter as a financial planner? Okay, well, I think because we're all so, so individual, and this is, you know, it's really starting to understand how you work best. You know, really try to start logging. When do you work well? And then work out what factors are present when it allows you to be at your best. What stresses you out too? Um, and that might be where you see someone like me um, that starts to build that self-awareness, uh, you know, and if you have, or you know, either privately or if you've, you've you know, if you haven't got a, a formal diagnosis, if you have got a formal diagnosis, you know, there's government funding through access to work to help people work out. OK, so what are what are the problems that you're experiencing? Is it executive function challenges? Is it just procrastinating and getting started? Um, and and that sense of overwhelm so that we can then look at what's the best way forward? Um, what do what? what works for us. So you might go, okay, so what do I need? What works best for me? What time of the day do I work best? You know, am I somebody that actually I don't get up and run until lunchtime? Or I've always been someone because I've worked and studied a lot that I can get up and start working at five in the morning, but past nine o'clock in the night, forget it. So, so it's working out what works for you. Um, and there's things that you need, like that connection with others, positive challenge. What are your strengths? What's important to you? So let's focus. So you've got a particular challenge. What are you good at? And again, with, with as, a, as an ADHD coach or a neurodiversity specialist, we go, okay, what are you good at? What's and you, you a lot of people go, oh, I'm not good at anything. It's like, yeah, you are. You're brilliant at loads of stuff. Um, you just it just feels too easy, so it doesn't feel like work. So um, it's going no. This is these are strengths. You know, we've got positive challenge. We're using your strengths and we're focusing on on the strengths rather than, oh, God, I can't do this. And the negative self-talk comes in. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that sense of contributing to something that you value, that feels meaningful for you. Uh, and then reviewing how you're spending your time and then through a process of your self-evaluation and your self-reflection what is it that's making things work for you what are you finding challenges with and that might be that it's in your environment and it's not within your control so that then that starts that conversation of of a non-judgmental environment where you can say to someone this is what's impacting on me and again with the access to work and those things even if you are self-employed you still will be able to access um access access to work um so yeah because it is that that working out what works for me and what interests me what do i value where do i want to be some i mean some fantastic insights there that are really really useful um and 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 nice practical things that we can go away with uh and so kind of leading on from that in terms of um, things that uh, perhaps individuals can do um, to to kind of help themselves or, or navigate some of the challenges that they might encounter. Um, I would like to talk about exams and revising for exams, preparing for exams. There's a lot of people in our community who will be going through um, their, their exams in order to get qualified to become financial planners. Do you have any strategies for those people or perhaps people who are just lifelong learners who would want to keep, um, you know, updating their knowledge and skills. Do you have some strategies um, you could share in terms of uh, revising, for example? Well, my biggest biggest thing was make it interactive, make it fun. Willpower is a very overrated, limited resource. So it's, again, that, as we were talking about before, bringing the strengths, what's important to you, and then creating a framework for success, make it easier for you to, to revise. 
So again, we can we can sort of set go. Okay, think time. Think back to a time you were successful and found it easy to learn, and then you can identify what were the factors that made that easy. Now it may it may go off, oh, no, but it doesn't. It could be that you remember all of the football league tables stats. You know, you don't you didn't actively think, oh, I must sit there and learn those. So the factors that may have been included in that um, are things like repetition, interest, emotion, involvement. You care about the results. You've got connection discussing it or, or you know, so so again, it's not necessary. You know, how do I learn? It's it's not just the, the sort of four exam. It's just how does, what does what, how does my brain work? You know, back at school, it might be that you were on competition or pace marked against other people in the class. It's acknowledging or acknowledgement and recognition from a teacher. So it's what f worked for you and a, a sense of moving forward for that. It might be that you're particularly visual. So a mind maps, stick it on the wall. Um, do I need to body double? Now that's just working with someone else because if we're working and we're studying, it's hard at the end of the day when we finish work to then think, right, let's do some studying. But if we create an online group where you meet, you say, you've got that connection, you've got that community, then you say, okay, we're all going to look at X. You mute, you work there, so you can't go off because you're there. Um, and then maybe teach each other. Teach somebody else and reinforces it. There's other things like um, Pomodoros. I don't, people have heard of Pomodoros where you set a time and you work for 25 minutes, you have five minutes off, same things. You can do those on online communities. And then you looking at the environment that you've got, make it work for you, whether that's you know related to your faith family you know maybe go to when you go to the gym take some old school flashcards you, know, you go on the you go on the running machine you've got them there you go on you, you you do some weights and then you keep coming back you've got lots of repetition that's how we get accelerated learning so it's it's habit habit stacking learn something else at the same time it might be that you play the piano so you do a bit of revision then you play the piano and then by the time you get to the exam you you're, you're picking up you're creating those positive associations um and and that just makes it makes it easier make it fun make it that you want to do it yeah and just a note on in terms of revising and and preparing for exams we've got a master class by the brilliant peter leah um that will be this podcast will be released on friday the 10th so Peter's uh, masterclass will be on Tuesday the 13th. Again, if you missed uh, that at 11 a.m. on Tuesday the 13th, that will be Thank on you. our uh, community as well. Um, but some fantastic points. And we're going to move on to our two last questions that we ask everybody. But before we do, just a final kind of um, sound bite, perhaps, from you. One or two points. What can we do to create a more inclusive workspace in financial planning, just to round up uh, this side of the conversation, Linda, what can we do? Well, we want base level inclusive environment, which is good for all. So, you know, because we don't necessarily need to have a formal diagnosis or if we don't want to disclose, so we remove that need to mask. So what level of base level inclusive technology that is good for all is available. So I don't have to go and ask, oh, can I have this? Can I have this on my computer? Can I have something that reads text? Can I have can I have something that I can dictate to? Can I? It's just what's available to everybody. I haven't got to sort of out myself if I don't feel I, I, can, I can. AI is amazing. There's just so much going on there that we, you know, we can we can look at. There's also, you know, maybe we invite a company in to do a whole team um, you know, workplace awareness on neurodiversity or other intersectionalities and things, things like that. Um, so that we up the awareness and knowledge of everybody. Um, but it's, you know, again, it's that sense of, it's that removing any sense of, of, of judgment there. And it's an unusual balance of skills. And because we make a mistake, we have a bad day in one area, it doesn't mean to say we're not brilliant in another area. And I, I think one of the things that, um, and I'm not, I haven't checked this out, but it was, it was something about Richard Branson going in and not understanding the difference between gross and net. And you're going, what happened? 
<laughs> and it's like, okay, well, I'm dyslexia. I just can't get my hands on on which was which. Um, but it's it, you know, he obviously understood how to create profit. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's not like, oh, well, don't make him CEO. He doesn't know the difference between gross and net. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it's people are good at what they're good at, and you know, sometimes they can forget things. Um, I, I, so it's not that it's taking away judgment um so other people may need to be someone need to be a it's a verbal processor and that they need to to brainstorm ideas to clarify how they think it's not saying they don't know what they think about those things it's just that process of how do we work do we love to brainstorm or do we need to come with a fully fledged idea so it's it's working with, with different way so non-judgment yeah non-judgment perfect excellent okay so moving on to our final two questions that we ask everybody who comes on the podcast the first of which is we always like to ask our guests for a book that has helped them in their career so far so linda do you have a book for us that's helped you well there's a brilliant book by um thomas brown and it's called smart by stock smart but stuck and it's emotions in teens and adults with ADHD and it and it's brilliant and and you can listen to it on you can you can go off to his website and get a really sizable chunk free um <laughs> free audio listening um or listen it's a, it's a good one to listen to audio as well or read the book and it basically sort of this is this is ADHD all the theory and then it goes into case studies of this is how it presents for this person and this is how it presents for this person and do you might identify with this and the whole fact that if you if you're very smart you're probably going to be late diagnosed ADHD because you would just you know you just weren't noticed um but if if we don't recognize these things it can lead to very negative coping strategies amazing okay so final question for you then and it's perhaps a slightly unfair question to ask uh, someone not in the finance pro profession themselves but i'm going to ask it anyway um and that is linda what are you most excited to see in the world of finance in the next 10 years well it's just the you know individuals getting greater autonomy just greater access to education so that we can build better financial habits you know whether that's through apps or online or community but also doing that in a more environmentally friendly way because we have to yeah absolutely well that was a fantastic discussion and and i've learned so much uh throughout this discussion so thank you so much for sharing your your wealth of knowledge and wisdom with us all thank you so that was linda kelland on the next gen planners podcast if you enjoyed this podcast then please do share it on all social media platforms you can listen to past and future episodes on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and on our website which is nextgenplanners.co.uk on our website, you can find loads more information about our brilliant community. And finally, if you can, do leave us a review. It helps to grow the podcast so we can get it out to even more people. Thank you very much.